thank you, thank you for your introduction. Thank you for inviting me here today. The setting is a bit unusual and unfamiliar to me that I actually are in front of kind of the slides. Um, well, the the whole environment, uh, I'm pretty honest, I'm talking very honest to you today. Uh, I was questioning myself, how come or how you actually came to me? Why did you invite me today? Uh, with regard or the background of, you know, women in STEM uh, 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 teaching and lectures and university and background. So, well, that led me to bother you now a little bit with my CV or a uh, a short intro to my CV, giving you a background on my story. I am pro probably the prototype of a student or a scholar who did not know at the time when she started studying at university what she actually is about to do. I had no clue, but there was one thing clear to me. Uh, I was interested in technology. So uh, back then, I'm a bit <coughs> older than you guys here or the attending audience. Um, for me, the logical consequence has been that I studied business informatics. But at that time, no best uh, exhibitions existed or whatsoever. So I had a little, little knowledge what business informatics actually will bring to me and what it is about. So that's how I actually came into this area and into this division. And if you would ask me now, did you follow a, you know, a specific career path? Were you clear that you would stay in academic? I'd answer with a clear no. No clue. That came to me, the further actually I came in there with my, um, I can't really show you, so please follow. So it was for me a, a logical consequence. I've been asked for tutoring. I became a student assistant. I got involved in project work all the while I was still studying. And that's how I actually got introduced to academic life and what it means to do research. And from there, actually, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, for me, the decision was clear. I got offered with a PhD position, I would take it, I would become a researcher and take it from there. But, and now the but arises again in my talk, is for me it was clear I would not go into basic research. Not saying that it's not important, of course it's very important, but for me it was always that my drivers were more in applied science, in applied research. So business of informatics of course was the right field for me there. So, and I became quickly involved with uh, topics around uh, business informatics at that time. Back then, electronic data interchange was the big thing. So that actually where I did my, uh, my PhDs on. And that brought me in the first steps already uh, into, you know, conferences, uh, uh, workshops, also committees. Uh, around the globe. Uh, I was traveling, pr pretty unusual traveling a lot while I was already, already a pre-doc. So I visited plenty of places uh, work-wise in China and Japan and Australia, even in Africa. Uh, actually less in Europe that came later on before that I start, started globally and of course US. So. Um, I got to know, know different cultures, I got to know uh, how education and different cultures uh, work together and also I got to experience what communication, communication styles, different cultural styles mean in this regard. I took this with me in my research and came back and then wait, went basically a uh, normal way and pass. I took uh, visiting research positions in Southern Australia, in Singapore. I've been on a postdoc research grant from the Austrian Science Fund uh, at the Technical University in Sydney. And then I got appointed as a professor, assistant professor position in, at the University in Liechtenstein, where I founded and headed then a competence center on interorganizational business processes, basically in my research area. And from there, uh, the situation or the path became a little bit uh, upside down. 
because what happened there was that I got more and more intrigued with the with the consequences of research, research results, uh, what to do with it, and especially that there is a big point missing at universities. And I took my opportunity when I came back to technical university. Coming back to technical university didn't mean that I proactively came back to TU. Actually, I was asked to come back. I was actively searched and scouted by uh, colleagues who knew me, who knew the way I work and asked me to come back for a specific task. And that was, they had in mind a global view or global vision that at the Faculty of Informatics, they wanted to do something with innovation. <coughs> I found it quite funny when they talk like this, they wanted to do something in with innovation since they actually, from day one on at the university environment, had to do with innovation. But what they meant was to implement innovation and steps to, uh, towards an entrepreneurial university as a third pillar next to research and education. And that's where the starting point in 2011 when I joined Technical University again. Basically my home, home base where I started from. And from there on uh, things went the way you will see in the, in the next slides. Maybe one point I should stress at that moment is that during my pre-doc, I already showed that I always uh, thought a little bit outside of the box. For me, it was probably the reason because I was maybe, you know, lazy or whatever. I had, I had lectures where 600 students participated and it was pretty cumbersome to do Übungen in there. And so I had to come up with something innovative to organize this lecture, basically. And that brought me already the first award on innovation back then in 2002 for lecture in e-commerce. That brings me to a definition I stumbled across, which I found quite funny because I never heard before of an enterprising person and what that is. This definition is drawn by the National Center for Entrepreneurship in Education. Uh, it's basically a, a community uh, in the UK and England, not mainland. And it constitutes a set of personal skills, attributes, behavior, you know, also motivational capacities that pretty much de describe me. If one would have told me, you know, I know you're an enterprising person because I know you already for several years, it's, you know, intuitive decision making, capacity to make things happen autonomously, networking, initiative taking, opportunity identification, problem solving, most of the time problem solving is a very creative part, strategic thinking of course, and self-efficiency, and the ability to cope with unpredictable environment. And the unpredictable environment in the environment I'm working now is pretty big, I would say, but more on that later on. So I thought, okay, that pretty much describes me, I never used so many words when someone asked me what I am, what kind of type of person I am. I always said, okay, I'm a type of person following the just do it approach. I want to have impact. I want to change things. I want to do things. So uh, you can imagine not moving forward could get on my nerves pretty quickly. And I'm a person who probably works best under you know, pressure. That's something I learned about myself as well. So now actually we are coming to uh, the, ma the main topic of my, my talk today, to the entrepreneurial university and what I'm doing there around at the Technical University of Vienna. So first maybe a definition, so on an entrepreneurial university, what is it? I, so good news or bad news, there is no one size fits all definition to it. There are several attempts to identify or define an uh, entrepreneurial university in literature, but actually without reaching any consensus. But, and now I think that's also a very funny point, is back in 1993, Etzkowitz was the first one coming up and he actually already followed an approach from a prior people uh, looking around what's actually the central concept out there. So the entrepreneurial actual university is actually defined nowadays with a central concept to the triple helix. Who of you knows triple helix? Who is familiar with that? 
Okay, triple helix is nothing else that someone, bright person, came up with something very obvious, that there is a triadic <coughs> relationship between university, industry and government. No, no. So, uh, pretty basic research, isn't it? So, adding knowledge dimensions to market and government. That's what it is. And just you have to think about it. Back then in 1993 and 1995. So, it's around for a long time and it took Europe quite long to come up with an implementation what could even come close to an entrepreneurial university. Uh, predecessors uh, in this regard, so they were earlier than Austria and other uh, European countries, is UK in this sense. So they started, for instance, UK started in 2002 to adopt this uh, thinking, these models, and actually uh, uh, use it and transform it. I hope I didn't see anything you didn't mention this morning. <laughs> and we, especially at technical environments, uh, joined in a bit later. So what does it mean, knowledge-based economy, and what's the role of a university in this setting? Does it mean the role of a university in this major sense is on stake? Good news, no. So all the people who are currently still reluctant, oh <coughs> my God, you know, the free research, the free lecturing, all our, you know, freedom is on stake. I can tell you, no, it's not the case. Nothing changes on that point. But what does it, the knowledge-based economy? It definitely brings university on center stage because they are leading in the knowledge system. So that's a fact. So the chairman of social, so societal change through innovation and awareness training it's, has always been a place where traditional paradigm get challenged and future anticipated. Of course, that's at university where you make you know, sure to figure out what could be technology of, I don't know, 2030 by now, that you have the environment, that you have a green playground where you can you know, just test yourself. Uh, that's all advantages, of course. But one thing is really clear and I really want to focus on and, and make the point here. University must never work only in the service of industry. At the same time, it would be pretty deconstructive to be isolated. So it has to be a shared knowledge, working together, collaboration. And I think uh, to you, you know, sitting in here, being interested in these topics, uh, that's not news. So that's actually out there for quite a while. So just the focus on interdisciplinarity becomes more important than ever. And interdisciplinarity actually on different levels. So it's not only interdisciplinarity on university between different faculties, between different verticals and disciplines. It's also cross domain in the triadic system, university, government, industry. So it's about synergy with academy, industry and government, building upon on each other with their own strengths, resulting in a whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And definitely, I mean nowadays, who has not read about the digital revolution, digital roadmap, Austria, whatever, ICT basically plays a big role in the digital revolution. All this brings me now to the point what I'm doing at Vienna University of Technology. I started and took it as my goal and vision to bring the entrepreneurial university closer to TU Wien and implement concepts in a speed that's possible in an environment uh, like a University of Technology in Austria. Uh, it's a big house, many people involved, Still very bureaucratic because uh, lots of bureaucracy because, of course, it's powered by government. So um, many issues to deal with, but as I said before, I am this uh, enterprising person, so that's just a challenge and I have to deal with it. So what I implemented so far, and here, I full stop, I said I, that leads back to why I'm here today, STEM environment, language, female language or male language. What I'm using right now. Human mm, not only human, that's definitely male language. I, because I claim it's all my result. A female language would have said here right now, we, 
we established, we as accomplished, we did. Definitely, but I am actually putting that out on the floor right now to trigger questions afterwards. So probably. Not for that reason, I disagree, but I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> so I managed. We have a discussion going on. <laughs> no, I would be perfectly fine doing it afterwards. Okay. So okay. Maybe we ask all these questions after the talk. Okay. Cool. Looking forward to that. So um, what's implemented at the TU Wien so far is that we had uh, established two paths currently for you know, the staff members, the TU scientific staff, the researchers, and also for the TU students. Uh, I started with, or we started with, uh, the education on intra and entrepreneurship uh, for students. It's a diploma supplement, which uh, was established <coughs> in 2012 at the Faculty of Informatics. Uh, that had to do with uh, when you establish a diploma supplement, you have to go through, you know, university uh, councils, uh, back into the ministry. It's not so easy that you can actually just place a whole curriculum somewhere and do that. So I needed a home base to start with where I can do that. And my home base was the Faculty of Technology because they were open minded and were open to it and said, yeah, let's do it. Um, so this actually runs already since 2012. We are currently into the sixth batch. They started in March and um, basically uh, renewed and complemented maybe missing topics from that day on. We always have feedback loops and uh, feedback loops from both sides, from students, from lecturers. And lecturers in this case are definitely not lecturers from university, they are lecturers from the world. They are dealing with what they lecture on a daily basis. So we have really trainers and mentors and uh, people supporting this uh, curriculum coming from the background they are lecturing in there. So if there is someone lecturing on finances with venture capitalists, uh, I have, like last year, we had two different views on that, what it means with dealing with venture capitalists in Austria and Europe, and also what it means dealing with venture capitalists from the US. I had a guest professor uh, from the US here, and the students, um, yeah, I would say, after the first lesson, they didn't know actually what's happening to them because it's a completely different word, world and it's necessary to be uh, confronted with that. Of course, you actually reflect on that later on and you need to put it into you know, perspective, but it's necessary to do that. And having said this, so all different kind of topics are tackled by well-known uh, high-profile uh, international guest lecturers coming every year and every season again to do this together with us. At the same time, I established a uh, Start Academy, which is a boot camp for researchers. Researchers uh, are our PhD candidates, uh, our project uh, staff members, our main research staff members at TU, professors. So basically all of them uh, working under the title of scientific staff members at TU <coughs> have the opportunity to um, challenge their results for commercialization in a three-day boot camp. It's pretty challenging and it's really, that's why I call it boot camp, it's really boot camp style. We're sitting in one room locked in basically for three days, day and night, food provided, coffee of course, Red Bull, and work on all the different tasks that's necessary to be tackled to get an idea of what it means to think about commercialization and then to take it from there. And all these streams, maybe also worth mentioning is that there is also at the Faculty of Informatics and currently I'm working on it, that it's cross faculty wide implemented like this is that all PhD students at TUV have to do mandatory lectures on innovation and business model definition. I think it's very important that there is several, several ways out of uh, academic research, especially when 
academia is not paying well. So you need to be enthusiastic about the things you do, otherwise you wouldn't stay there. Um, especially when there is uh, an environment where you know that after these four years, five years, you have no contract anymore because the so-called Kettenverträge are in place and you're actually not allowed to be uh, employed any longer at the same institute. Or, and I call it modern slavery, is when you are brought to, uh, to exceptional work in 20 hours, paid by being paid for 20 hours or 25 hours maximum, and the rest of the time is your free time to do your hobby PhD. So I think that's all uh, an environment uh, that's not very fruitful for uh, where I want to go there. And so we need to come up uh, with establishing different paths and opportunities and options. So from these three channels, basically, uh, we go into or we channel into uh, conferences, speech challenges and, and demonstrations and, and demo presentations. What does it mean? That means that all the ideas that are out there are actually uh, displayed to the potential investors, customers, industry partners out there. So it's uh, more or less like an exhibition kind of a roadshow of TUVIN, what's happening there, because there are so many great results. Uh, this year, for instance, there is like a one million funding, public funding uh, per year for uh, prototypical implementation of research results. And in total, I think there have been several, seven projects being awarded and four of them went to TU Vienna again. So um, lots of marketing and PR to do there as well to actually get the information and the knowledge out there. Um, what I see here on my slide is, uh, I should also mention the I2C award, especially since I stressed that the environment is not so comfortable for some uh, uh, concepts at the TU, not only TU, but other universities as well, like Kettenverträge or modern slavery, is that especially for PhD results that are really have a very high research potential for commercialization, I implemented uh, the I2C award. It's basically a six month scholarship because PhD students are not used to much money. Uh, scholarship to, for them to have the opportunity after they finish their PhD to really focus six months on commercialization. Incubated, guided, mentored and basically taken by the hand and guided through. Aside of that, we have since 2012, so we are in season five with the founder and investor talk. It's a bi-weekly investor talk series, public, open for public, with international, inter and national guest speakers. And I always try to span, you know, uh, the bandwidth from investors, early stage startups, spin-offs, which is a very different world, because with regard to on how they actually acquire money and uh, get funding, and how on what basis they work on. Also, with regard to the investors, they you know, tell you what it is to work with them, what they expect from you, what it means, how to approach them. So all this you know, uh, nice to know insights and inputs before you actually do a cold call, because that's uh, a no-go basically. Then aside of that, uh, we featured a distinguished speaker series which is a speaker series where I get international uh, high profile people to discuss. That's a, that's a different format. So far it was a guest talk, but it could also be like a panel discussion or a, a, a round table discussion with speakers, you know, bringing together experiences from different nationalities and world, world part of the world on how they deal with uh, the entrepreneurial university and what brought them forward and also with regard of what it requires to change in the economic uh, ecosystem to bring Austria forward. So that's basically also meant to bring input to the government and game changers who have impact on changing things towards the way we need it. On the next step, so it doesn't stop there, is that we have a founder space at TU Wien. So we have a little co-working space where these projects who made it through the, that made it through the juries of the different pathways of the Start Academy or the Diploma Supplement 
uh, are funneled into this founder space where they undergo like milestone sessions, mentoring sessions on different, different topic, have lots of access to the network and will be pretty <coughs> personalized, guided through to, to the steps they need at the very, very stage they are in with their uh, adventure and endeavor of uh, starting up or spinning off. And in addition to that, we have the TUV incubator. It's an incubator for breeding and commercializing uh, projects of the Star Academy and the Diploma Supplement. And this uh, is uh, basically funded by the RVS Jumpstart grant. Missing components. What's there yet? I gave you a brief overview what's there now and what's there yet, but missing components. Missing components are implemented concepts, really concepts that allow that uh, scientific staff members can, for instance, go on a sabbatical for commercialization. It would be necessary when you bring your idea, your baby, to the market that you get time for that. At the same time, guaranteeing that you can return into your normal career path, into an academic career path. Because it doesn't mean that everyone who is actually in academia wants to spin off in a way that this is the end of the academic career and no return anymore. So they want to actually get this off the ground, kick it off and then stick to it as a, for instance, scientific officer position, with a scientific officer position. But the chance to do that is not implemented yet in a, in a normal way. Maybe there are exceptions, maybe there is, you know, like on an individual basi basis already agreements, but it's not out there that you have the opportunity to get a sabbatical of half a year or maybe even longer if you want to do that. So then definitely a modification of the current in-house valuation model. I don't know. Uh, how apparent it is, because uh, I think all, you know, what I take as normal information to have is just based on or because uh, of my background and I've been within these walls and, and, and environment for so long, is I guess nobody really knows or sees that the current valuation model at university is only based on papers, paper output, what you publish. This goes so far that it's not only, you know, the little dot in your CV. No, it's that actually money is distributed across the disciplines and faculties at university. So at the end of the year, all the department heads fight for each single paper that's published in their department, because that means money from the government. So that's how money is distributed. And of course, when that's the income channel, in addition to third party money, um, your boss is most likely not the one really supportive when you come with the idea of I want to actually spin off and start up. So we have definitely to modify the current in-house valuation in, in this regard. Uh, and there are examples out there, it's just one to pick and implement. In addition, what comes across my current daily life at the moment is that we need physical room for spin-offs. Whereas when you talk about startups in the ICT area, all you need is a table, a laptop, working internet and maybe a cloud, and you are happy. But it doesn't work for other disciplines at the technical university. So there is lab space involved. They need room for putting up or setting up reactors. They need room to, you know, to test trials. And they definitely need the close access and the close uh, co-working combination with their department of research. So it's Rome. Since we are all located in the fourth district and we have not really an explicit campus, but all our uh, institutions are closely set together, we kind of, so if you know TU Wien and you work there, then you uh, also know that actually we do have a campus there, but it's not so obvious. Um, it's pretty difficult to acquire more room in the fourth district. You know, inner city circles, not so easy to actually get more space, but we are working on that. I personally consider that a wholly owned technology transfer company is necessary because that would kick ass in terms of that they need to think business-like and not governmental-like. Um, associated with this, uh, I draw the idea of that there is a necessity for venture capital in, in investment company. Then necessary for an entrepreneurial ecosystem 
is that you have industry with own research department located in Vienna. And I preferably would see that in, as a kind of like a techno park and an additional innovation campus. But there is more ideas to that and I don't want to bo bore you with that. So my goal is to explore the entrepreneurial potential of Theogin, to accelerate the knowledge-based economy, more spin-offs, more startups, so student entrepreneurship, commercialization, licensing, proactive licensing of patents and co-innovation, of course, really cooperate innovation, provide concepts needed for their academic entrepreneurship and complement the existing with the missing and convey into an uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And definitely one goal is to achieve an entrepreneurial acting university. This means exemplify entrepreneurial behavior and actions to all participating parties. This means role modeling within university with entrepreneurial thinking. Why I say this? I give you a few numbers just on the human resources at University of TU Vienna. So we are 3,347 currently scientific staff members and 50% of it is third party funded. This means mostly for three years, which again means there is a three years time period for PhD students to finish their PhD and then they are kicked out. Uh, and we have 140 professors out of these 3,347 uh, scientific staff members and we have 29,000 students and these two numbers are basically the reason why you don't find us into this international rankings of you know quality universities because we just come up with the right numbers for these uh, statistics because too many students too little professor what does not mean that there is not good quality and actually our outcome is way better than the achieve with a different ratio in other places but this simply you know we simply can't change the rules on the stats for the rankings that's even led that far that our uh, university uh, management even said we are not participating in these rankings anymore we don't care we are not filling in the forms anymore we have 2,400 graduates and you can read actually how they deploy into the different bachelor, master's, PhD and diploma engineer levels. So plenty of knowledge there, plenty of opportunities and we should just should get this off the ground. And this slide and that actually follows for the discussion or is the input for the discussion we actually are about to start. This slide I only made again for the female slash male way of presenting things. Because now I am in, uh, in principle trying the male path of language, in my experience. Now I, I stand here telling you what I have achieved in these four years. Because I think actually it's pretty much. But the female way of me, so I'm stepping aside, normally would never ever go out there telling, look what I have done in these four years. Because to me it's actually pretty natural that I've done this. It's straightforward. But of course for my self-marketing I have to step on the other side because I am in the man's world in academia. Where you say, okay, you need to tell that you are good because others don't see it obviously. And you need to tell what actually you have done. And if I tell you that I have done this all actually alone with the half time assistant help, I think it's even more impressive. And it's really difficult for me to say these words right now, honestly. It's for me a test because it's not in my nature. I would never do that. Thank you.